We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In God's speed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Okay, my feet are out. Okay, I'm out. How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? So in that baby light, there's no doubt about it. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 105 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. And now, the first Saturn launch, SA-1, Part 2. Recapping from the previous episode, the first Saturn, SA-1, has been delivered to the Cape from Huntsville, Alabama, by barge. The fully functional first stage, S-1, and the dummy upper stages have been erected on the launch pad. It is August 1961. Andrew Pickett's Vehicle and Missile Systems Group spent the next month installing the accessories of the SA-1 and conducting a series of launch vehicle tests. The purpose of the test was to make sure that various components responded correctly to pressure stimuli. The remainder of Pickett's group checked for leaks caused by the barge trip and the subsequent erection of the S-1 stage. The first week, the group performed pressure switch functional tests, verifying the pickup and dropout pressures for several hundred switches. Then the Saturn's 48 nitrogen bottles were tested at one-half the operating pressure. The purpose of the nitrogen bottles was to pressurize the RP-1 kerosene fuel tanks during flight. During the second week, Pickett's group checked out the pressurized and venting capability of the liquid oxygen tanks. When air pressure was applied to a switch in the tank's electrical system, the switch, when functioning properly, would terminate pressurization at a certain level. If excess pressure built up, a second switch would vent the gaseous oxygen. Next, the liquid oxygen and RP-1 system leak checks were performed. In both tests, The team pressurized the tanks to about one-half the operating pressure, looking for seal links. Concurrently, the remainder of Pickett's group conducted a series of engine tests. First, they performed a low-level nitrogen purge of the liquid oxygen dome located at the top of the H1 engine. The purge began prior to propellant loading and continued until shortly before engine ignition. The purge served several purposes. Since the nitrogen exceeded atmospheric pressure, it prevented contaminants from entering the thrust chamber nozzle and flowing up to the injector plate and liquid oxygen dome. The purge also prevented moisture from condensing in the area. If a launch was canceled, a full-flow nitrogen purge would quickly expel all liquid oxygen from the dome to avoid a possible explosion. Similar purges were also performed on the liquid propellant gas generator, liquid oxygen injection manifold, and the fuel injector manifold of the thrust chamber. Once again, these purges were performed to prevent the entry of unwanted substances. On September 6th, the full tank pressurization test was performed. Since there was a possibility of an explosion while bringing the launch vehicle to full pressure, launch operations directorate officials cleared the pad for the Wednesday morning test. The two-hour exercise went smoothly, and that afternoon, engineers were back at the launch vehicle for further operations. Now, this next section of checkout is dedicated to the instrumentation and electrical engineers in the audience. Calibration of the measuring devices that were to report more than 500 flight measurements was a daily operation. Sensing devices such as transducers, potentiometers, thermocouples, and strain gauges measured pressures, 
propellant flows, temperature, and vibration. A signal from one of these sensors measured in millivolts was routed to a signal conditioner which amplified the reading until it could be read on a scale of 0.5 volts. The calibration of these signal conditioners, popularly referred to as black boxes, was a major concern of Reuben Wilkinson's measurement group. The teams sometimes simulated a sensing device by tapping on a portion of the rocket to cause vibrations or by placing a hot soldering iron near a thermocouple. But most of the time they simulated a signal with an electrical input through an interrupt box located between the sensor and the signal conditioner. The measuring group removed faulty instruments from the launch vehicle for further checks at calibration stands or in an instrument calibration laboratory. The team was also responsible for the blockhouse measuring station. Here launch operations directive received 100 ground measurements on the rocket and ground support equipment as well as telemetry data. Next, Daniel McMath's telemetry team checked out the booster's eight RF links. Seven of the links used the old XO-4B package telemetry system from the Jupiter rocket flights. The XO-4B telemetry system had 15 channels of continuous data and 54 multiplex channels. The eighth telemetry link system was developed by the Guidance and Control Division in Huntsville to ensure sufficient data channels for the Saturn I because it sent much more telemetry back than the Jupiter rocket. The central feature in the new XO-6B telemetry system was a 216-channel electronic communication system. The system used multiplexers to continuously sample 216 sensors and convert their reading into one output signal. The signal was broadcast over a radio to the control room where it was demultiplexed back into the 216 separate sensor readings. So the 216 separate Saturn measurements traveled on only one radio frequency. Continuing with the checkout, McMath's telemetry group first tuned the two sets of antennas located at the forward end of the S1 stage. The six-man team next performed transmitter and power amplifier checks, tuned the frequency of the radio equipment, and verified the telemetry wiring. After all eight telemetry links were checked out, the team reconnected the measuring and telemetry systems for subsequent tests of the launch vehicle. During the first month of checkout, Jim White's tracking group worked on the tracking system for the SA-1 which involved cameras, radio, radar, and telemetry. The radar systems were controlled by the Air Force. The S-band radar provided position data by tracking the Saturn beacon. The C-band radar was a backup if the Saturn beacon failed. The telemetry employed two baselines. One set of antennas located south of Launch Complex 34 determined whether the rocket made its proper turn out to sea. The other set, southwest of Launch Complex 34, ascertained flight path deviations downrange. Moving on, at the midway point in the eight-week checkout, the scheduling committee planned a radio frequency compatibility test. This was a significant test for SA-1 because it was the first time the vehicle stood alone with the service structure removed from the pad for a complete check of the radio systems. Power was applied to the vehicle's radio systems to transmit signals to Cape receiving stations for telemetry, radar, and command and control. The launch team was particularly interested to see if the test would cause any interference in the self-destruct system. Earlier launch programs had involved two or even four telemetry links. SA-1's eight telemetry links increased the possibility of radio signal interference 
that might introduce spurious signals to activate the self-destruct system. Fortunately, the compatibility test served as both a validation and a confidence function, proving each radio channel's performance and demonstrating that no serious interference would enter the destruct system. And there was an unexpected bonus. The test also demonstrated the launch vehicle's stability. Shortly after removal of the service structure, a sudden September storm subjected the rocket to 48 km per hour winds with no ill effects. In the fifth week of checkout, Launch Operations Directorate started Integrated Systems Test. Overall test number one was the first run of the launch vehicle's sequencing system, which was the relay logic that controlled the last minutes of the countdown. This test was successfully completed. Overall test number two, called a plugs dropped test, which meant the vehicle would use its internal power with ground support disconnected. This test was also successful. Overall test number three was the most important. It pulled all systems together in a check, verifying the previous five weeks' work. The launch team began preparations for the test Saturday, September 23rd. The advanced work fell into seven categories, vehicle networks, ground networks, mechanical, electrical support, measuring, radio frequency, and navigation. Vehicle network requirements included the connection and verification of telemeters, calibrators, radars, and 60 test cables. Overall test number three, conducted on Monday morning, went well. Officials were increasingly confident that SA-1 would fly. By early October, the original launch date of the 12th had slipped eight days. On October 4th, the launch team conducted the liquid oxygen loading test, a major exercise for SA-1 since it represented the first integration of the CAPE's cryogenic support equipment with the Saturn vehicle. Launch Operations Directive followed this successful exercise with another plugs drop test on the 10th. Engine swivel checks were completed by the end of the week. The launch team began the ninth week of checkout with the simulated flight test, the last major pre-flight test. The test went well, but officials delayed the launch another week while they debated the merits of adding more sensors near the base of the booster to provide additional information on the critical bending during the first 35 seconds of the flight. But it was finally decided that SA-1's instrumentation was adequate and the launch was set for October 27. During the last week, Launch Operations Directorate personnel installed the ordnance for the self-destruct system and then repeated the simulated flight test. And now we can finally move on to the launch. No previous maiden launch had gone flawlessly and the Saturn C-1 was considerably more complicated than earlier rockets. Launch Operations Directorate officials gave the rocket a 75% chance of getting off the ground and a 30% chance of completing the 8-minute flight. Although the odds on a pad catastrophe were not quoted, launch officials acknowledged their vulnerability. With the construction of Launch Complex 37 barely begun, a pad explosion could delay the Saturn program a year. Critics had questioned the wisdom of the clustered booster design. Propellant pumps were supposedly reaching design limits, and the Saturn C-1 had 16 pumps and 8 engines. Some experts derisively referred to the SA-1 launch as Cluster's Last Stand. Saturn backers were expressing confidence in the rocket, but concern about its launch effects. During test firings at the Redstone Arsenal, 
Residents 12 kilometers away had reported shattered windows and earth tremors. Pre-launch preparation began at 7 a.m. on October 26, 1961. Mechanical office tasks that morning included inspection of the high-pressure gas panel, cable mast, and fuel mast, ordnance installation, and preparation of the hold-down arms. At 12.30 p.m., Thomas Pantoliano's 12-man propellant section checked out the RP-1 kerosene fuel facility while Andrew Pickett's team pressurized the helium bottle. RP-1 loading began an hour later. The propellant team filled the launch vehicle's tank to the 10% level using a slow manual procedure of approximately 750 liters per minute to check for leaks and they found one. A leak in the fuel mass vacuum breaker was easily repaired, and at 2.30 p.m., the launch team cleared the pad for automatic fast fill operation. Fuel now flowed into the launch vehicle at a rate of 7,570 liters per minute, reaching the 97% level in about 35 minutes. The propellant team then reverted to the slow fill procedure. As the design of the Saturn included a fuel drainage system, Pantoliano's crew placed 103% of the required RP-1 aboard the Saturn. Just before launch, the propellants team would take a final density reading and drain sufficient kerosene to achieve the desired fuel level. The 10-hour countdown started at 11 p.m as Launch Complex 34 switched to the CAPE's emergency generating plant. This facility supplied the launch team a current relatively free of fluctuations common in commercial power. The Saturn's electrical circuits and components began warming up when vehicle power was applied at T-570 minutes before launch. Five minutes later, the measuring panel operator turned on the eight telemetry channels. A series of calibration checks followed. At T-510 minutes, range and launch officials initiated an hour of radar checks. Loading of the liquid oxygen started at 3 a.m. on the 27th, T-350 minutes. The Saturn's liquid oxygen tanks were 10% filled to check the tanks for leaks in the launch vehicle or in the 229 meter transfer line, as well as to pre cool the line for the fast flow of the super cold liquid oxygen. The 10% level in the Saturn's tanks was maintained for the next four hours by feeding liquid oxygen from the 49,000 liter replenishing tank. Testing of command and communication system began at T-270 minutes. The flight control panel operator activated the guidance system's stabilized platform to check pitch, roll, and yaw responses. Ten minutes later, the network panel operator placed the vehicle on internal power to ensure that the Saturn's batteries functioned properly. Meanwhile, other engineers conducted radar and telemetry checks. Operation was over by T-255 minutes and the launch vehicle was returned to external power. Then, two hours from the 9 a.m. scheduled liftoff, an unfavorable weather report prompted launch officials to call a hold. But conditions improved and the count resumed at 7.34 a.m. Next, the launch team rolled the service structure back to its parking area, 180 meters from the rocket. The propellants team set up the liquid oxygen facility for fast fill at T-100 minutes. The order to clear the pad came 20 minutes later. The blockhouse doors swung shut at T-65 minutes. One hour from launch, the pad safety officer gave his clearance and the propellant team initiated a six and a half minute pre-cool sequence. A slow fill to recool the main liquid oxygen storage tank line, which had not been used for several hours. When the pre-cool was completed, the light flashed on and the liquid oxygen facility's pump began moving 9,500 liters per minute into the Saturn. 
In 30 minutes, the tanks were 99% full. Liquid oxygen loading changed over to the replenish system. An adjust level drain had already been made on the RP-1 kerosene tanks, bringing the fuel level down to 100%. Launch officials then became concerned that a patch of clouds over the Cape might obscure tracking cameras, so they called a second hold at 9.14 a.m. But soon a northeast breeze cleared the skies, and within half an hour the countdown resumed. During the last 20 minutes, the launch team made final checks of telemetry, radar, and the command network. Away from the launch complex, 34, Cape Watchers gazed uncertainly at the Saturn rocket as the countdown neared completion. The launch team had set up panels and microphones at the Cape to register the Saturn's shock and sound waves. At the press site, three kilometers from Pad 34, Reporters were issued earplugs as a precautionary measure. Launch Operations Directorate officials had assured local residents that fears of the rocket were exaggerated. Still, everyone wondered what it would be like. Automatic countdown operations commenced at T-364 seconds. The onboard sequencer took control. It monitored tank, hydraulic, and pump pressures, ordered a nitrogen purge of the engine compartment, and closed the liquid oxygen tank vents to pressurize the liquid oxygen. At T-35 seconds, SA-1 switched to internal power. Ten seconds later, the sequencer ejected the long cable mass. At T-5 seconds, the pad flush command began a flow of water around the launcher's base. At that time, a number of possible malfunctions a premature commit signal, insufficient thrust in one or more engines, rough combustion, short mass failure, detection of fire, or voltage failure could still cause the automatic program to terminate the countdown. The moment of truth came at 10.06 a.m. Contrary to popular belief, no one pushed the firing button to send SA-1 on its way. Launch came when the sequencer ordered the firing of a solid propellant charge. The gases from the ignition of the charge accelerated a turbine that in turn drove fuel and liquid oxygen pumps. Hydraulic valves opened, allowing RP-1 and liquid oxygen into the combustion chambers, along with a hypergolic fluid that ignited the mixture. The engines fired in pairs, developing full thrust in 1.4 seconds. A final rough combustion check was followed by ejection of the liquid oxygen and RP-1 fuel mass from the booster's base. The four hold-down arms released the rocket four seconds after ignition. SA-1 was airborne. Spectators saw a lake of flame, felt the rush of a shock wave, and then heard the roar of the eight engines. Trailer windows at the viewing site shook in response to the Saturn's power. Yet for many thousands watching the launch, the roar was a letdown. Reporters thought the sound equaled an Atlas launch viewed at half the distance. The Miami Herald headline the next morning read, Saturn Blast Quieter Than Expected. Although the Saturn's roar failed to meet expectations, the human noise at Launch Complex 34's control center was impressive. A NASA information officer told reporters that when the rocket passed Max Q, which was the greatest point of aerodynamic pressure at about 60 seconds into the flight, everyone in the blockhouse celebrated. The flight itself was nearly perfect. The rocket reached a height of 137 kilometers and impacted 346 kilometers downrange from the launch site in the Atlantic Ocean. The only minor problem was the rocket cut off 1.6 seconds ahead of schedule. This was traced to the fact that there was 400 kilograms too much liquid oxygen and 410 kilograms too little RP-1. Hours later at a press conference, Kurt DeBoose's face reflected the happy sense of accomplishment when he informed the press that it had been nearly a perfect launch. The success was particularly welcome to the Kennedy administration, coming at a time of high tension between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. 
The raising of the Berlin Wall had stunned the Western world in August of 1961. President Kennedy had responded with a partial mobilization of U.S. reserve forces, but most political analysts considered the events a Russian victory. In late October, as the Soviet Union prepared to test a 50-megaton hydrogen bomb, President Kennedy had proposed a massive fallout shelter program. On the day of the SA-1 launch, Russian tanks moved into East Berlin for the first time in several years. The space race was an important element in a Cold War that threatened to turn hot. With the success of the Saturn booster, the U.S. had achieved a launch capability of 1.3 million pounds of thrust. Space reporters were quick to point out the limits of the American success. The Soviet Union already had workable upper stages for their first stage. Furthermore, the current Russian test in the Pacific would likely result in sizable booster advances. Despite these caveats, commentators agreed that SA-1 was an important step toward a lunar landing. Thanks for listening to this archive episode of the Space Rocket History Podcast. If you are financially able, please support the podcast by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. Thanks.